Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Farley. Um, when Laura Lee first told me that my topic was rhythm, I was highly amused by this because I cannot spell rhythm to save my life every time I write it out. Um, it's like Dan Quell trying to spell potato. It's just an epic fail. Um, and then the other reason I was amused was because the first thing I thought of when I thought of rhythm was music. And I am not musically talented in any way. I cannot sing. I cannot play an instrument. I married into a very musical family. My husband plays multiple instruments. His mom actually plays the accordion and they do like jamborees at Christmas. And I'm like the dud on the side on the couch over there. Um, so I was like, I don't know. I don't know what to think about this rhythm thing. And then I went on a kayaking trip. I was in Hawaii. It was beautiful. I thought this was going to be a really relaxing um, sort of vacation activity. I was with my aunt who was a pro kayaker, but this was 25 years ago and before she had shul sul uh, shoulder surgery. And she still thought that she could do what she did 25 years ago. And it became very clear right away that she couldn't. And she couldn't even really row at all or, or do anything with the paddle. And so the guide kind of comes up to me um, and goes, this is going to be really hard, but you're going to have to steer from the front. And I was like, oh shit, I don't know if I can do this. And it became a physical sort of challenge that I had to face. And I don't know if there's any other kayakers here. I know Tom's here with Prana Consulting. He does kayaking. Um, but I'm, I'm a noob at this. And so I immediately start thinking, okay, I can do this. I'm psyching myself up. And I'm, I'm, I'm really going here and I'm starting to get really proud of myself because I have a genetic kidney disease. I've had a lot of health problems over my life. And so I'm sitting there thinking, I'm doing this. I'm making this happen. Look at what I'm doing. And then I look out in the distance and everybody in the group is a mile ahead of me. I am dead last. Even the guide abandoned me. I'm like just back there. And I thought, I hate myself, I'm the worst. And it became this battle to where I would grip the oar really, really tightly and try to control it fiercely. And that didn't work. And then I would just kind of give up and I'd be like, okay, whatever. And then we'd float off to the side. And I found all these thoughts going in my head of why can't this freaking kayak just go straight? And why can't I make this work? And why can't I control this? And then I had this moan of clarity where I thought, gosh, I think this way about life all the time. Why can't this just be easy? Why can't this just be a straight line? Why can't it all be super simple? And it became this amazing metaphor for how I looked at life. And I did eventually find a nice moment where I was able to not be super control freak and not totally let go and have this kind of in the middle zone. And I thought, what does that look like for my entire life? When I zoom out and I look at my life as a whole, what does my life rhythm look like? And it was really fascinating because when I got approached to talk about this, um, I don't know if it's like my brain was just hyper-focused on rhythm or the universe started presenting opportunities, but I use a meditation app. And the meditation that I got for the day was uh, tuning into your soul rhythm. And I was like, hmm. And then the book that I read that night had a chapter on your life rhythm. And so I spent some time really thinking about this. And I started to think about actually a chart that Quinn Tempest is here. She um, is the founder of the Create Your Purpose Collective, which I was a member of, and I love it. Um, but she showed this chart one time of progress um, that entrepreneurs that she has in her business. And a lot of people think when you start out, you're going to be here. And if you do all the right things, the line's just going to keep going up and up and up and up and up. But when you're creative, when you're an entrepreneur, it looks like this. It's like a, a roller coaster, right? And that's normal. That's totally normal. And what I realized was it wasn't just my business that was kind of doing that as an entrepreneur. Um, it had been my life. My life rhythm was also doing a lot of this. And so something happened in 2019 where I tried to find a way to sort of at least for my own life rhythm, keep that middle line as close as possible and not fluctuate with these huge 
valleys and, and kind of peaks and everything. So what happened in 2019 was I used to be a manager at the USA Today Network. I'm not talking about this to brag. I'm going to talk to you about it because it was my total burnout moment. I was managing 32 properties. I had a team of 20 people. If you know anything about news, that was constant breaking news all the time. I was such a horrible person to live with. God bless my husband for staying with me during that period of my life. I was extremely overweight. I had chronic migraine. I was, uh, it was just a mess. And I was sitting there in a review with my boss and she was really excited to tell me that you're doing great. Your next step is to become a director. Let's talk about your five-year plan. And everything in my body just screamed, no, I don't want that. And so I did something that um, some people might have thought was a little crazy. I um, decided to leave and I didn't quit that day. I actually set up a plan um, to, to save money, to make sure we were financially stable, talk about it with my husband. That's not the crazy part. The crazy part was I did not want to find a job right away. I didn't want to look for anything else. I didn't want to do anything else. I didn't want to do anything, period. And this became my year of the hermit. And it literally was a year of the hermit. Not only did I quit my job, I pulled out from every commitment that I had, board positions, volunteer positions, um, pretty much everything you could pull out of, I pulled out of. And the reason I did this was because as I was sitting there in that job review, there was a moment where when I said, no, I don't want this, I could not answer for myself, what do I want? I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know what made me happy or brought me joy. I didn't know what I was curious about. I didn't know how I ended up as a manager at USA Today. I never wanted to be a journalist. I called it an accidental career. So I wanted to remove all of that external stimulus and input and just everything else that gets placed on you so I could hear myself, so I could hear my own rhythm. And I realize that this is a privilege and that not everybody can do something quite as drastic. Um, and to be fair, I didn't intend for it to last a year. I thought it would last for three months. I plan planned for three months. Um, what I realized was it took three months for me to just chill out and like be able to breathe. And then it ended up taking a year to go through that entire process. And so during this year of the hermit, I learned some valuable lessons and I want to share some of those lessons with you today and hope that they will be helpful for you to have a sustainable life rhythm. So number one, commit to spending time alone with yourself. It sounds simple, but it's so powerful. And that looks different for everybody. I don't care if that's idea sessions, having coffee on the back patio in the morning. I don't care if that's journaling or a meditation practice, or if it's taking the dog for a walk every day by yourself. You have to commit and invest into spending that time alone with your thoughts, with your feelings, with who you are uninterrupted. And the big part of this is you have to prioritize it just like you would any other commitment to anybody else. So what I mean by that is I schedule time on my calendar that is non-negotiable. Do not cancel that time. And it is as much a priority to me as going to a meeting with any of my clients or showing up to an event. It is just as much of a priority to me. So that is tip number one. When you start showing up for yourself, when you start committing to yourself, something really incredible starts to happen where you actually get to understand what your motivations are, what your meaning is, what your values are. And then you get to start making decisions and taking action based out of that place. Number two is kind of tied into this. Commit to set to spending time doing something that sets your soul on fire. And again, this doesn't have to be huge, but what I want you to think about and take a second to think about it, you know, what lights you up? Is it just when you go to music and you hear 
a musician playing live and you get goosebumps and chills and you feel that in your soul? Is it when you're drawing something and designing something and you lose track of time and you have no idea what's going on in the outside world because you're so into it? What are those things that fill your well? And then I'm going to repeat myself because it's important. Put time on your calendar to do those things. Make it a non-negotiable. What you'll find is that a lot of people will say, that sounds great, Melissa. I don't have time to do that. I'm going to recommend to you um, doing a, a time audit. I don't want to talk about that in this, um, in this conversation, but there is ways to find where you're spending time that don't align with what's actually meaningful to you. And that's the time that you should be using to do this kind of work. Number three, this is one of my favorites, fail. Fail a lot, fail fast, fail often, and reframe how you think about failure. So 2023, I don't think I did it big enough. I'm actually probably going to do it for 2024 too. If Quinn knows this, I chose my word of the year was failure. And the reason for that is because there are a lot of people who wait until something feels perfect or they are the absolute best at something before they make a move or before you try a new experience or before you put yourself out there. And that's such a disadvantage. And the other thing that happens is you might have heard of like a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. Fixed mindset people are me. That's me. I don't want to be. I'm working on having a growth mindset, but I'm a fixed mindset person. I absolutely feel that I can't celebrate or acknowledge success until the outcome is complete and it went well. That's not a great way to actually function or exist or experience the world. So growth mindset folks actually tend to have um, a little more happiness all around because they enjoy the process. And so as you experiment with this idea of failing often, I'm asking you actually to kind of just reframe what success is. I'll give you an example. Last year, I applied to be a speaker at Alt Summit. It's a huge conference for women uh, creators and designers. And um, I didn't wait to find out if I got selected. I did not. Um, but as soon as I hit the button and submitted for that, I celebrated. My husband and I went to a nice dinner. We made it a big deal. Why? Because I didn't think that I was worthy of doing that. And I did it. And it felt really good just to do it. So the reward, the thing worth celebrating is the doing. It's the action. It's not the outcome. If you can find ways to do that, to take moments to celebrate the small things along the way, you will find that you'll feel more motivated for a longer period of time, as opposed to having maybe a negative outcome and then getting disappointed and, and giving up or not continuing. Okay, the next one is, um, is something that I find that a lot of people experience pushback around. And that is the power of the pause. The power of the pause came about when I realized part of my overwhelm and constantly feeling out of rhythm was that I was always letting people determine what my schedule looked like and how my time was being spent. So I was just getting emails or text messages or opportunities and saying, yes, I was a total yes woman. And then I realized my time wasn't my own anymore. And so one of the things that is so simple, but again, will help you set healthy boundaries and take that time to actually reevaluate again, if this is something that you want to be doing, something that aligns with what you consider a meaningful life is pause. Don't say yes right away. Yes, I'm talking about to your boss, to everybody that you communicate with and say, this is a great opportunity. I need to think about it or I need to check my schedule. I'm going to get back to you. And it's not a diss. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a hard no. You're not turning away an opportunity, but it's giving yourself that moment to pause and reflect on if this actually makes sense for you. Another thing that happens for a lot of entrepreneurs is we jump at taking any clients that will come to us or we feel like we have to stick it out with, you know, kind of whatever con contract work we have or whatever situation we're in. 
That's not true. So one of the things I would recommend to you too is doing a pause and a reflect whenever you're in a situation where you're not sure that this is actually matching your rhythm and your flow. The last thing, I kind of want to bookend number one. And that is, right, so you are already committing to spending time with yourself, turning, tuning in with yourself, your life rhythm. But this last one is something that I encourage you to connect with other people. It's understanding that everybody has their own rhythm. Everybody has their own life happening, their own things happening that you are unaware of. And I learned this lesson. Um, I used to teach improv. And one of the things that surprised me the most about learning improv was that the superpower, the super skill to improv was not being funny or the fastest or the most witty. It was listening. That was a superpower in improv, was being an active listener and then being a good, creative, giving partner. And so a lot of times what I see when I'm working with clients who are trying to um, get better at networking or find out why they're not making connections in their life, right? They're not listening. They're showing up and they're just sort of word vomiting all these things that they think people want to hear. Really the most powerful thing you can do is connect with somebody and listen to them and then give something back that is valuable to them. So it's understanding that in order for you to have a full and balanced rhythm, you have to have that time with yourself to hear what you have to say. You also have to be aware that there's a whole other world out there going on in its own rhythm and you have to be a part of that. So I wanna tell you a little bit of a story about how this all kind of comes together, right? So we'll go back to the music analogy. I'm probably not gonna get the terms exactly right because again, I am not a musical human being whatsoever, um, but it, it really is helpful to think about this, right? So life has those big bass moments that kind of rumble and shake you up and kind of just rattle you to the core sometimes. And that's your, that's your valleys. That's when you're low, that's gonna happen, right? And then there's also the moments of the chorus where, man, you are singing and you are just alive and you are feeling it and, and oh, it is just so rich, but you can't stay there either. So in the chorus, you burn too bright, you burn out. And then in the valley, you get cold and you freeze everything out. So it's finding that space in the middle, that time where you get to pause and rest and reflect and plan and do all of those things to help you create sustainability in your life. And that's why I'm a big proponent of creating rituals and, and doing these kinds of commitments to yourself because life is crazy. It will take your time. And that's one of the things that I think about a lot, having a genetic disease, is time. You will make and lose money. You will make and lose promotions. You will make and lose friends. You will have all sorts of things come in and out of your life. Your time does not come back. That is your most precious resource that you have. And so when I think about my life rhythm and what that means, it's not spending a bunch of time burning out for something that doesn't have any actual meaning to me. And it also isn't healthy to be the hermit for more than a certain period of time because you have to be a contributing member of society and share your services and your talents and your gifts with the world, right? That's the point of being sustainable so that you can give back to other people and yourself. So let me tell you the story. I went on a tangent, sorry. Um, so it was interesting. Um, I, I was remembering a time when I was thinking about rhythm, when I was a young baby journalist in my 20s and everything I did that week was going wrong. 
if I touched it, it blew up. It was just a disaster. It was like, I should have just stayed in bed. I wasn't having a day like that. I was having a week like that. It was bad. And I was so ashamed and I felt so unworthy and kind of on the brink of like, I should just quit, right? Like, I don't even belong here. I shouldn't be doing this. And I went and I talked to my manager about it. And she said something that changed my life. And she said, Melissa, it's okay. You're not meant to be perfect and shine all the time. My job as a manager is to understand and see that when you are in a valley, that person over there, they're in a peak and they're going to take the onus of this week and they're going to run with it. And that's okay because when they're in a valley, you're going to step in. And that's part of my job as a good manager and a good leader is understanding the rhythm of my team and how this flows. Flash forward 10 years later, I now have a team of producers and there's a young producer sitting in front of me. She's got tears streaming down her face. She has been working on a project for probably the last two weeks and it all just kind of went to shit and she's ready to hand me her resignation. <laughs> and I'm like, it's okay. You're not supposed to be perfect all the time. It's my job as a leader to understand that you're going to have peaks and valleys. And when you're in a valley, they get to pick up and shine on that peak. And that's your job too. Whether you are a manager or a leader, whether you are part of a team, that is your job as a human to be aware of those journeys for them and for you. You have to be your own manager in that way. You have to be your own advocate in that way of understanding what your life for them is looking like. Now, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because in 2019, when I went through all my stuff, burnout was not like the accepted kind of known term that it is now. Everybody knows about burnout. And I think there's so much stimulation in the world today that is so distracting and pulls us in so many different directions. And I would say that most people probably don't think about their life rhythm and how they want the flow of their life to feel on a day by day basis. And so my invitation to you is one, don't beat yourself up about it. If you've never thought about it, it's not a big deal. I didn't think about it until I was 35. Um, and give yourself a little bit of grace, but start thinking about it. Check in with yourself. So one of the things that I do, this is a bonus tip, is I actually have an alarm on weeks that I know that I'm in a valley where I will set an alarm for every couple of hours. And when it goes off, what it says is, what is the kindest, most compassionate thing you could do for yourself right now? It's just a question. And what it does is it stops me and it goes, wow, yeah, I was just talking really mean to myself. While I was working on this project, it wasn't going well, or man, I haven't eaten today. <laughs> or, you know, I'm, I'm just so overwhelmed. I'm gonna get up and go for a little bit of a walk. What is the kindest, most compassionate thing you can do for yourself? And I wanna be very clear about this. That is not selfish to ask those kinds of questions, to give yourself that kind of attention, to be that present and aware of yourself. If anything, what it does is it sets you up for success to be able to show up better for everyone else that you're serving. So if you do all these things, I'm not promising you that your life will be perfect. It will not, it is life, it is messy. We are not robots. It's gonna get hard and crazy and weird sometimes. But what I am promising you, maybe I shouldn't promise you, don't sue me. Um, what I am hoping is that, again, your life will, your rhythm will kind of stop looking like this, you know, mountain range of the Alps. And you'll find a little bit more of a steady line that you get to feel more sustained and balanced through your creative process as somebody who is working, as somebody who is just existing as a human being, 
and as somebody who wants to do great things in the world, because I know you do, that's why you're here. And those are my tips for you. Laura Lee, I'm short, I know, but 